Good morning. I'm Judy Woodward, the History Coordinator of the Ramsey County Library. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this talk in the Great Decisions series. Our speaker today is Richard Leach, who will speak on the topic, Myanmar and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Richard Leach is an award-winning scholar and teacher in the Political Science Department at Gustavus Adolphus, where he teaches courses in international relations and comparative politics. Today's program is brought to you through the co-sponsorship of the Osher Lifelong Learning Institute of the University of Minnesota, Global Minnesota, and the Foreign Affairs Association. We are deeply grateful to all these organizations. This talk draws on the 2022 briefing book, which gives background to all the Great Decisions talks. Through the generosity of Global Minnesota, we have a number of briefing books available for checkout at our libraries. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to turn things over to our speaker, Richard Leach on Myanmar and the Association of Southeast Asian Nations. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. Thank you for that nice introduction. If I uh, am correct, I think this is my third or fourth time with your group, and I thank you again for inviting me today. As Judy said, we are going to be thinking about Myanmar and the Southeast Asian nations um, known as ASEAN, but the focus of the chapter was actually Myanmar's never-ending crisis. I'm assuming many of you have read the chapter in the Great Decisions book, and at the end of my presentation, some of the questions in the back of the book are going to be presented on the screen, but feel free to ask other questions. So here we go. Here are two side-by-side -side maps of Myanmar. The one on the left shows the population of Myanmar and neighboring nation states. Of course, there's India and China with large size populations, but Bangladesh is also a country with a large population. Myanmar is relatively smaller, Laos is smaller still. But on the right side, we can see the main ethnic groups and their locations in Myanmar. And you can see that they are in clearly identifiable regions of Myanmar, with some exceptions like the Shan people, for example, are located in more than one location in Myanmar. Um, but we will think about that map a bit more. You can see that there are many ethnic groups in Myanmar. It is certainly not a united nation state with one, um, one nation. I don't think many nation states on the planet are with the exception of Japan perhaps and Korea, South Korea and North Korea. But you can see that there are many um, different uh, ethnic groups in Myanmar. And in fact, there are 135 recognized ethnic groups. The recognition is granted by the government. So that's important to remember. Two thirds of the population are ethnic Bamar, also known as Burman, and they have controlled the military and the government. The Rohingya, a group that we are familiar with, are not considered one of the 135 recognized ethnic groups. They are uh, therefore deprived the rights of citizenship and no nation state is going to favor uh, Rohingya as cruel as that sounds, but they are um, for all intents and purposes, a stateless people, similar to other historically oppressed groups of ethnic minorities throughout the world. We could think of Roma, for example, in, in Eastern Europe or Kurds in the Middle East. They are all fighting for their independence or their sovereignty and respect from the international community, but that respect is lacking. This graph is dated, but it still holds true. Um, Buddhism is the primary, the predominant religion in Myanmar, but there are also other religions that are practiced. So here is a brief historical timeline of what is called Burma and also called Myanmar. And I will tell you what the difference is in a bit. Myanmar was once colonized by the British and they separated from British India in 1937. It was then occupied by Japan and by Thailand simultaneously 1942 to 1945. So there was a moment of simultaneous colonization 
but Japan was dominant at one point of that short period and Thailand at another part. But towards the end of it, Japan was the primary and in fact sole colonizer of Burma. Um, in 1948, Burma achieved its independence from Britain and the first leader after some struggles uh, within Burma for who would take leadership. The uh, eventual leader was um, a general who decided he was going to embark on a socialist path of development for Burma. It led Burmese down a dark path of economic catastrophe. And he certainly was not an economic policymaker or visionary. He was more a military person. But for uh, those decades, you can see there, he was in power for 26 years. Burmese people suffered uh, immensely from his misguided rule. Well, what happened, um, this misguided economic policy uh, became a, a source for people to revolt against the government in 1988. On August 8th, 1988, which is known as the 8888, of course, uprising, it was led by students and why? Well, the source of their frustration was the demonetization of the then current currency of Burma. And I'm not gonna give you too many details, but what was happening at Burma at that time was there was rampant inflation. So the military government decided if they just make certain currencies that were at that point legal tender in Burma, if they just outlaw them, make them prohibited for use in any kind of transaction, then they would somehow tame inflation. Well, that essentially wiped out a lot of people's life savings and there was no pre-warning that this was going to happen. Well, some of the people who were most especially harmed by this demonetization were students because they had saved money for tuition and fees and suddenly they were caught off guard and they weren't able to pay those tuition and fee um, expenses. So they started this uprising on August 8th, 1988. Well, the military, of course, responded with violence. And this was a horrible moment as the uh, rest of the world watched. But at that time, uh, you might remember, this is before Tiananmen Square even, in 1988, we really didn't have the type of global media coverage that we now are accustomed to. So CNN really didn't have any presence in Burma for us to watch. Uh, even with Tiananmen Square a year later, we did see until they pulled the plug um, what was happening in Tiananmen Square. But for the most part, there was no international military presence in Burma in August, 1988. Well, coincidentally, Aung San Suu Kyi, who became the accidental leader of the democracy movement started by those students, happened to be in Burma to take care of her ailing mother who was getting on in age. Prior to her reappearance in Burma, Aung San Suu Kyi was a resident of the United Kingdom where she had met a man uh, who was a scholar of Burmese um, history and they ended up getting married. They had two children outside of Burma. Those two boys were born in the United Kingdom but she went back to Burma to take care of her ailing mother. And coincidentally, this was in August, 1988. So those students who didn't have a named leader at that time looked to Aung San Suu Kyi as their leader. And here she is with her husband uh, in an earlier year and their first of two sons. But why did anybody recognize Aung San Suu Kyi as a potential leader of this democracy movement? Well, that's because she was the daughter of the founder of Burma, or also the father of Burma, if you will. Um, he certainly didn't start Burma from early civilization, but after World War II, he was the person that people looked at as the next leader until his um, supporters ended up assassinating him for multiple reasons that are not really important for us to think about now. But anyway, uh, Aung San Suu Kyi's father was considered to be the father of Burma, an independent Burma. And what was his role during World War II? Well, he took the side of the Japanese forces. He was a collaborator with the colonizers from Japan against the British government who had previously 
occupied Burma as part of their South Asian colonization, including India and then what became Pakistan. So when the Japanese said, we are going to start colonizing the world, of course, because location matters, they started with closer to home nation states. And they colonized um, a, a vast expanse of Asia, if you look at this map, but here is Burma. And Aung San Suu Kyi's father was fighting the British and he joined forces with the Japanese to do that. Now, was he thinking truly about liberation from the white oppressors as Japan claimed that was the foundation for their colonization of Asia? I don't think so, but maybe he was just calculating what would be the better side to join and eventually to get rid of all foreign forces from his country. From 1962 to 2011, and then again from 2021 to the present, Burma has been led by a military government. So you can see the first was almost 50 years of military rule. And now we don't know when military rule, which resumed in February of 2021, will end. We honestly do not know that. But one thing to remember is with that type of military dictatorship, we didn't really have any prospects for democracy in Burma or Myanmar. Uh, you can see that Aung San Suu Kyi as the leader of the democracy movement in Burma was awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1991. And you can see the commendation that she received. Um, she was not able to receive the prize at that time because she was under house arrest but um, you can see that the, the, the Nobel Peace Prize Committee lauded her accomplishments towards democracy, which if we look at it in retrospect was um, interesting wording. So again, she was under house arrest for almost 15 years. She was released in 2010. And some people have wondered, well, why did the government release her from house arrest? Um, some people would say maybe the government miscalculated and never assumed that she would ever be a threat or because she was under house arrest for so long, maybe she would have been out of the memories, the collective memories of people and that she would never ever win as many um, seats that were up for election as her party ended up winning. So the government maybe didn't feel concerned about her or threatened by her but also maybe people were concerned that she might die under house arrest. And then you have a martyr, which is possibly even a worse scenario than her um, challenging the government for elected seats in a representative um, legislative body. And I refrain from calling it a democracy because I'm not sure if uh, Burma also Myanmar has ever really truly experienced democracy. Well, in January, 2011, as you can see there, Time dubbed Aung San Suu Kyi the spiritual heir of Gandhian nonviolence. Again, a quote that might in retrospect come back to make people kind of raise an eyebrow and think, really, was she like the peace-loving Gandhi? Um, did events turn out otherwise that would challenge that assessment? Mm, yep, okay. So President Obama visited Burma in November of 2014. And he's right, for many progress and implied there is demo uh, democracy or democratic rights or human rights has not come fast enough. The backdrop here is Aung San Suu Kyi's residence, um, but she decided as this Wall Street Journal headline says, when she was a candidate for elected office that she was going to avoid going to the part of Myanmar where the um, Rohingya are the dominant population. She didn't want to make that a campaign issue at all. So essentially, she just thought that they were not important to recognize the struggles that they were experiencing or to in any way em empower them. Uh, but she was clearly avoiding that part of, of Burma, Myanmar. So her party, the National League for Democracy, which I will just use the abbreviation, it's easier to say the NLD swept to victory, as it says there, in November 2015. You can see here 
the results of that election. Um, they have a bicameral legislative branch in Myanmar, just like we have in the United States. And one quarter of those seats are for just army people. And then another part of this elected body is reserved for people who are also presently in the military. So there's two parts there that are military dominated. Um, and here she is, she or her party won the national election, but she became in all other places, the president, the leader of her party in a parliamentary system would be the prime minister as we know, but because the Burmese government, the, the army, drafted a new constitution that explicitly prohibited any leader from having any offspring born in a country other than Burma, which implicitly was calling out Aung San Suu Kyi and prohibiting her from ever becoming the true leader of the government. She was prohibited from becoming the governor leader. Uh, so she became the de facto or the title that they gave her was the state counselor of Myanmar. Um, the real president was uh, this man named Win Mia. And I have to apologize for those of you with us today who can speak a South Asian or Southeast Asian language. I am not able to do that. And I apologize for any min mispronunciation. But Win Mia was the president of Myanmar. Um, and okay, so you can see that. And uh, Aung San Suu Kyi was the state counselor. So under the 2008 constitution, as I mentioned, um, those 25 seats, 25% 25 of the seats were military, um, military people. That, that, that was just enshrined in the constitution. And they were the only ones who could veto any proposal for constitutional change, which is important to remember. So here we are again, there is the uh, then the earlier election representation of those different groups in both houses of the legislative branch. Now they have a very uneasy relationship. We have Min Online, who is the leader of the military and his counterpart is Aung San Suu Kyi, and she is representing, put this in big quotes, democracy and other voices in Myanmar. And this was a very unstable relationship. Uh, it appears that they are getting along to get along. You can see there's a handshake. This is a public photo opportunity, I guess, but things were very conflictual between them. Here is Aung San Suu Kyi visiting the White House again as state counselor in September of 2016, meeting with then President Obama. And at that time, President Obama referred to Myanmar as Burma. Uh, you might say, well, why the difference? Well, the Western world had considered Burma to be Burma until 1989 and why that sudden change to Myanmar from Burma. Because of what happened in August 1988 and the military response to what the West perceived to be peaceful democratic protests, the violence created this image of the Burmese military authorities as being incredibly inhumane and the uncalled for acts of violence against peaceful protesters was something that the rest of the world could not accept. And Myanmar suddenly became Myanmar, but actually that was the name that Burmese had always called their country. Similar to if we were to go to Japan, we called Japan as non-Japanese Japan, but Japanese people refer to their country as Nihon or Nippon. If something terrible happened in Japan or in its relations with the world, and they wanted to change the appearance of Japan or the marketing image of Japan, they might resort to saying to the rest of the world from this point forward, call us Nihon, forget about calling us Japan. Now, was this just quick, shifty um, diplomatic speak or something? Perhaps, but the Myanmar government 
doesn't require nation states to call it Myanmar, but it certainly prefers that it be called Myanmar. Some people still want to remind the Myanmar government what did happen and that it is presently not a democracy. So sometimes they resort to calling it Burma to remind again, the international community what the state of affairs is in that nation state. So again, here is President Obama in referring to Burma as Burma, but subsequently even he referred to Burma as Myanmar. Um, so anyway, you will hear those words used interchangeably. Now, when I saw this headline, I, I'm not naive, but I was very saddened. Uh, religious discrimination in Myanmar. I showed you that earlier pie graph that said almost 90% of people in Myanmar are Buddhist. Uh, we are an interfaith campus at Gustavus, even though our heritage is one of Lutheranism, and we try to attract people of all faiths and educate people on all faiths, at least to the degree that we are able to. Well, we offer courses in Buddhism, but we also offer courses in Christianity and world religions. And sometimes the students in those Buddhism classes come away with this conclusion that all Buddhists are peaceful and they would never resort to violence. And then all they need is a corrective, like a headline like this, where somebody who is a proclaimed person of faith is saying, as a Buddhist, I want to slaughter Muslims within my own nation state. Now that, that's just shocking. It's, it's horrible, of course. Um, so here is Aung San Suu Kyi, herself a Buddhist, who back then, again in 1991, was recognized for democracy, human rights, and ethnic conciliation by peaceful means within her own country. That really didn't turn out to be the case. And why? Well, I showed you that earlier map of the clearly identifiable regions of Burma where there are ethnic minorities living. And one of those ethnic minorities, as I mentioned many times, is the Rohingya. They're located in Rahine State, which is right over here. And the nearby nation state, which is predominantly Muslim, is Bangladesh. Well, when the military government of Myanmar decided that it was going to, in fact, start violating the rights of Rohingya in Rahine province, those people and excuse me, they ended up becoming um, refugees. They were literally fleeing for their life. That's a bigger uh, map. I apologize for keeping the slide on the earlier one, which was smaller. But here they are fleeing from Rohine State. Now, either they're going to go across the Bay of Bengal and try to get uh, to their destination country, Bangladesh, or they're literally going to walk. And many ended up going to the Bay of Bengal and their boats capsized. And we might remember some of those horrible scenes of people losing their life in the open sea. Um, but the reason why those people were fleeing was because the government said, I guess, now is our chance to get rid of this problem minority group within our territory. Nobody really knows for sure because most people aren't going to have access to government documents and even less people will be given a visa to be on the ground. So as many as approximately 2 million Rohingya were living in Rohine state and half of them became refugees fleeing to Bangladesh. Some have been repatriated. In other words, they went back to um, Myanmar, but many of them haven't. So here is a refugee camp in Bangladesh, also a very poor nation state that is now confronted with this mass of humanity on their border. What are they going to do? Are they going to welcome those people? Are they going to consider them temporary as all refugees by definition are? Are they going to consider them eventual permanent residents within their territory? Are they going to be met with violence instead of a welcome? We don't know, but we do know that the Myanmar government knew that they were fleeing. And as this very short article tells us, they decided that they were going to try to make life miserable for those people who were fleeing violence and confront them with even more violence. So who in their, their right mind, except the most cruel person on the planet would decide 
to lay uh, landmines on the paths of refugees. Well, that's what the Myanmar military did. You can see this person, uh, he survived as a boat, as I mentioned earlier, a boat capsized, um, so close to their destination, child is dead. And what is his thoughts going to be for the rest of his life, but more particularly of the Myanmar government? Is he going to end up returning there? Will he feel like he's safe there? Will he stay outside of Myanmar? Will he try to be a person who will destabilize the government, speak out against the government? We don't know. But um, even though the Myanmar government has faced, as this headline says, global condemnation for violence, really nothing all that much has happened as a result of that supposed condemnation. And herself, again, a former professed and recognized Democrat, Aung San Suu Kyi, now that she's in charge, she, you know, her party swept to electoral victory in 2015. Well, now she's in charge as a state counselor, again, prohibited from becoming the president. And she decides to jail journalists who are speaking out about what her government is doing. Now, was she complicit in what the military decided to do with Rohingya? Who knows? And of course, she's never going to admit to it, but you would think that she had some levers of control to minimize the violence that was used against them. But this woman is spot on, a Rohingya in Bangladesh. She's right. They will burn us to ashes if we return. Um, I've never faced that kind of horrific outcome in my life or the potential for it. Um, I, I can only empathize with what must be happening in her mind right now. And the fear that she is expressing there, I think, is valid. Well, again, here is Bangladesh, a very poor country, not equipped to handle this mass of refugees. So what are they going to do with refugees? Well, every year, Bangladesh experiences cyclones. Bangladesh is a country that is below sea level. Um, Bangladesh decided that it was going to remove all these Rohingya refugees from most of the refugee camps and put them on an island that was uninhabited. And that's what they did. They just put people on boats and started to ship them out to the Bay of Bengal. Um, certainly not a humane policy, but what other recourse do they have? At least that's what they said. Is it time to use the word genocide? This is back in 2017. Well, that is a very difficult word to apply because in some cases, if it is used, that requires, it obligates those nation states to act. You are not supposed to stand by in the face of genocide and do nothing. Well, it's again, something that is going to cause politics, conflict between people. So if we apply the genocide word for the Rohingya of Myanmar, some other groups might say, well, what about this equally persecuted group? What are we going to do to save their lives? Um, the Myanmar government is guilty of genocide, the US government alleges. It doesn't say proclaims, it doesn't say has evidence to prove it, alleges. That seems rather weak. Tony Blinken? Um, same message, essentially. So here is Aung San Suu Kyi representing her country's government. Again, um, she is the leader of this government. And this is before the International Court of Justice, a part of the United Nations also referred to or officially called the, or unofficially, excuse me, called the World Court. So this is where nation states sue other nation states and seek adjudication of a dispute that they have uh, between them. And nation states have to be willing to be heard before this court. So uh, what has happened here? Well, a representative from Gambia, which is a predominantly Muslim nation state in Africa, as you know, I think 95 or so percent of the population in Gambia is Muslim, was bringing Myanmar a Buddhist, predominantly Buddhist nation state and its government to the world court to seek redress and also to an end of the violence that the Myanmar government had perpetrated against Rohingya, who again are Muslim. 
So here is Aung San Suu Kyi essentially behind this lectern, essentially saying, our government has done nothing wrong against these people. And she, you know, was just laughed, essentially laughed off the stage, not there, but subsequently when people were reading what she said, they, they thought to themselves, well, you know, is she concerned about her well-being? Uh, is she really under the thumb of the Myanmar military and she has no opportunity to really share her concerns in this public forum? But why is she saying that there's nothing wrong with what we're doing? And that wasn't verbatim, but essentially that was the message. So the Rohingya refugees realized that the way people were getting their messages across each other or to each other was by Facebook. Uh, here are people in Myanmar who are using smartphones and they are posting messages about fleeing Rohingya. And when they've heard that Rohingya would be here or there and the methods that they were going to use to attack Rohingya, the military isn't the only actor that's using violence against fleeing Rohingya or Rohingya who are still in Myanmar. There are plenty of people within Myanmar who just don't like Rohingya and they're using their own weapons of violence against them. There are also significant number of militia, um, non-government military units in Myanmar, which I will show you also. So there are plenty of weapons available and the Rohingya found out that Facebook was the platform that anti-Rohingya Myanmar citizens were using to, um, to plan their attacks against them. Now, I don't think that Facebook is going to get, uh, you know, any, or the, the Rohingya are gonna get any money out of Facebook and certainly not $150 billion. I think this was just a statement by them. But here is Xi Jinping, and you will see another um, picture of him with the military leader in the next slide, but here he is, and he has that same countenance that he usually presents in public. We rarely see a smile, but how awkward is this? He is shaking the hand of the supposed uh, democracy um, leader in uh, essentially military government of Myanmar, and this is in January 2020. But here he is meeting with the military branch of that government, and now he's actually smiling um, a bit more. Uh, why is that? Is that because his government is concerned about the rise of democracy in a neighboring nation state? Yes. Is it because he prefers the military over democracy? Yes, again. Uh, but here he is meeting with those two counterparts leading the same government in Myanmar. This is in January 2020. Well, what happens? There is an election coming up in January 2020 when Xi Jinping is meeting these two people and the election happens and you can see that the National League for Democracy dominated that election. Out of the 330 constituencies, they claimed 258. Well, that is quite an electoral victory. So you can see this map is pretty much red. Well, February 1st, 2021, the date that those elected officials were supposed to be uh, taking their positions in the Myanmar government was also the date that the military decided we've had enough with this experiment in democracy. And there was a military coup. The democratic process was all of a sudden drawn to a conclusion. That was it. It was thwarted, it, was, it ceased, whatever words you want to use, but democracy was ended at that moment when the military returned to power in a military coup. And you probably remember this date, but if you look at it, it's almost two years ago, February 1st, 2021. So who came to power? Well, guess who? The counterpart of Aung San Suu Kyi in that dual leadership government. Um, the military of Myanmar, the Tamudo, I can't say that um, again perfectly, but that's the best pronunciation. Aung San Suu Kyi was placed under house arrest, as were all of the other people who were the leaders of that democratic, excuse me, the democratically elected government. Aung San Suu Kyi herself did not have a Facebook account until that moment. And so she started one to communicate with her supporters. The military of Myanmar is the second largest in Southeast Asia. They are a formidable force. 
They allowed initial protests by people in Myanmar. You can see the date of this. It's February 8th, 20, February 9th, 2021. So this happened on February 8th, 2021. But at some point, the government is going to say enough is enough. You can see again, peaceful protests, a sign designed for the Western media audience because it's in English. Well, you don't accept a military coup, but you as citizens of this country, what rights are you going to have? And more importantly, will the rest of the world come to your defense and or your aid in trying to overthrow that military government? It's not gonna happen. So again, here you see people with signs that say, give back democracy, peaceful protests. We even see Buddhist nuns who are involved in those protests, people who, are concerned about the, um, the sustainability or the flourishing of democracy. I'm not even sure if sustainability is an appropriate word there. That would imply that it had already taken hold. And again, that is debatable. But what is the future prospect of democracy in Myanmar? Well, certainly most people in any nation state just want to live a life of peace and opportunity, not one of violence. But of course, again, uh, the military said enough is enough. And after 10 days of peaceful protests, they said, we're going to stop the protests because this is making us look foolish. Or what happens if those protests are sustained? And now they have traction. And now people are really figuring out how to work together to overthrow this military rule. To do something like this, again, mass murder, an example of mass murder. Um, you can read this. If anyone wants this complete PowerPoint, please send me an email at my Gustavus email address and I will share it with you. But people who have peacefully protested in the past and their peaceful protests were respected, now they're not respected. Now people aren't just going to go home uh, those people who maybe would resort to violence are now using violence, but they don't have the weapons on their side. They are not part of a militia. Most of these people would have been the August 1988 type protesters. They look relatively young. Maybe they're university students, but they're throwing rocks. Well, they're outmanned, outgunned. The other side has the gun. Um, military shutting down internet services. That includes Aung San Suu Kyi's Facebook account. And people are uh, excited, of course, because some of the iconic leaders of the democracy movement have been released. Okay, well, again, what is that going to lead to? It led to, in part, the National Unity Government of Myanmar. This is a government in exile. The leaders here are imprisoned. Aung San Suu Kyi is living a life right now in a prison. She is not under house arrest at present. In her earlier stint, when she was in confinement, she literally was at her residence for those almost 15 years, but now she is in a prison. In the early part of the military overthrow of the de uh, democracy government or democratic government in Myanmar, people weren't sure where she was. Her whereabouts were unknown. People assumed maybe she was going to be returned to her residence, but she wasn't. She's in uh, prison. Well, this national unity government is including people from the main ethnic groups of Myanmar. It's not predominantly Burmese. Um, it is trying to cast a wide net and make this a true democracy. But they are a democracy that, again, is living a life uh, in absentia. They are um, in exile. So again, there are the leaders. They don't have any official authority. And I suppose that if at a time when the military government either gives up power willingly or they are overthrown in some way, that these people will already have been groomed to serve in those positions that their titles indicate in these slides. Okay, so here we are. Get that. Um, the general of Myanmar's military junta visited Russia. Of course, we know that Vladimir Putin is no fan of the United States, so he was welcomed with warm state receptions in his visit. Um, yeah, there are some people who are still trying, trying to foment opposition against the military government of Myanmar. 
And as I mentioned earlier, there are militias in Myanmar identified with people's ethnic identity. And those militias do have weapons. So you can see this slide again, feel free to contact me if you want all of them or just this one. But the government of Myanmar in its battles with the Rohingya is not facing much violent opposition. But for those people who are opposed to the military government and control over their lives, they do have weapons. They do have some degree of military training that they can represent a threat to the uh, continuity of the military government. As I wrote up here, and this will be very brief, maybe some of you are in fact refugees from Burma, um, but refugees from Burma made up the largest group of refugees to the United States during that one almost decade period. And here is a map. Even though this map is dated, it still holds true. We have a lot of refugees from Somalia and also Sudan in our state, but nearby we see Wisconsin and Iowa and also we see Nebraska that have significant percentages of Burmese refugees within their borders and other parts of the country as well. Um, the Karin people live in uh, anywhere where we saw that earlier map, but they live in Minnesota too. We have had Karin students at Gustavus. And as I wrote up there, they fought alongside the British against Japan in World War II and were promised their own nation state, but that never transpired and they've been persecuted ever since. So that is part of the reason why they fled um, Myanmar or Burma, but not the only reason. <clears throat> so the Korean organization of Minnesota is based here in the Twin Cities. They have events, they welcome everybody to those events. I've contacted them a couple of times by phone and to be totally honest about it, sometimes to figure out the correct pronunciation of words and they were very kind and patient with me. Um, but we have a significant number of Karen living in our own state. Myanmar government attacking Karen villages. Again, why would they do that? Well, maybe this is why we see refugees, whether they're going to flee to Thailand or they will remain in Thailand and that will be their country of final destination or they're going to end up somewhere else, including the United States. We don't know, but you can see the date of that. So now maybe the military junta felt emboldened and they were attacking other ethnic minorities in addition to the Rohingya. But again, here's another example of a militia attacking the government. So Karen people, um, yes, they maybe are going to be prone to violence as would any group of people who see the odds against them, the overwhelming use of military force by the government who's trying to execute them. They're not just going to stand by and let it happen. Agreed, Myanmar is nearing a civil war uh, and spiraling into a failed state or on the verge of it. Why would, why would Myanmar be a, a consolidated nation state at all? Um, if you look at the maps, it looks like it's so fractured that maybe it is better off if it is a amalgamation of individual Confederate states or entirely sovereign nation states or something, is it ever going to truly be at peace? Not sure. Uh, here you go. This one again, right before, uh, well, it was after Christmas, but before the new year. Why would you do this? The government feels like it is emboldened now to do this. Hmm. Okay. See, can see military of Myanmar is certainly not interested in human rights. To say that her imprisonment is a blow to democracy again implies that she is in fact a democratizer and that is questionable. China of course is not going to support any democratic movement in Myanmar. Um, China is the primary trade partner for Myanmar, both with exports and imports, as indicated by those two slides. And also Myanmar is the poorest of all ASEAN 
member nation states. You can see the per capita GDP compared to the counterparts, especially off the radar here would be Singapore, Brunei to a lesser extent, but um, Myanmar is a very, very poor country. Yet the military government, an earlier um, example of it, so when we had the 50 years of military rule before 20, <clears throat> excuse me, 2011, we uh, saw the military government relocate the capital from what we used to call Rangoon, called Yangon, to this new capital in the middle of the hinterlands of Myanmar. And as this person wrote, 11 lanes of a highway would have been sufficient, or two lanes of a, a highway would have been sufficient, but they were heck bent on building an 11 lane highway. For what purpose? We don't know. That money could have been used for better, more important quality of life things in Myanmar. And they were denied a seat at the ASEAN summit. There were plenty of countries that were concerned about what was happening in Myanmar, but look at these countries that are member nation states of ASEAN, all of them aren't truly democracies. Um, they all have problems with human rights and um, other than one party rule and other things that would be um, questionable you know, about their democratic promises and their democratic credibility. Um, the only country that can claim some degree of democracy would be this country uh, called East Timor. And some of you probably have heard of East Timor. It was at one part part of um, the Indonesia archipelago. It still technically is geographically, but um, they were colonized by Indonesia and before that Portugal. So they are predominantly Catholic and Indonesia is the largest Muslim population nation state on the planet. So there are conflicts between these two parts of this one part of Indonesia and East Timor received its independence from Indonesia in the 1990s. Well, um, this is the only place that is somewhat a democracy, but you can see how small it is, that is aspiring to be an ASEAN member nation state. It now is not, it has observer status. And at some point, maybe they will become an ASEAN member nation state. We can say there is truly one democracy. But uh, Hun Sen, the leader of Cambodia, certainly not a democratizer. He is visiting a military junta, and again, probably welcome with open arms. There's the poverty rate, um, very, very high. Wherever you see a darker shade of red, it means it's even more concentrated poverty. Very sad for the people of Myanmar. And that's not an academic um, profound statement there, but it is true. Aung San Suu Kyi was brought up on charges. You can see the date here. Got four more years in prison and then followed by a five year sentence. Um, constantly going back to court, more and more charges leveled against her, more and more sentencing. Um, this is when we first found out that she was in isolation in prison. This just happened this past summer, as you can see. Myanmar still sees Rohingya fleeing. Um, a more recent one, this again, early summer. Um, very sad. What's the international community doing? Well, unfortunately, people recognize the poverty of people in Myanmar, and also desperate people are going to do desperate things, especially if they are not living under a democracy where they would have worker rights or the rights of unionization. So we do see Western companies taking advantage of those circumstances. H&M, uh, based in Sweden, Zara, same. They are sticking with the made in Myanmar policy um, some other companies have decided that they were going to exit, but they decided to stay to create sweatshop clothing that we, I guess, think we need. And more recently, Aung San Suu Kyi's sentence has been extended to 26 years. She is presently 77 years old, so by the time she is released from prison, she would be 103 years old. Now, going back to a comment I made earlier, why did the military government release her from house arrest in 2010? Well, again, maybe they didn't feel like she was a threat. Well, why are they now extending her sentence for another 26 years? What if she does die in captivity? She will be a martyr. Is that really going to be beneficial for the military government? 
who knows what are the conditions of her um, prison? I, I don't know. Honestly, nobody knows. Is she be being treated kindly? We don't know that. So anyway, before we started today, Judy said we're expecting 50 minutes to an hour, and I think that that was 55 minutes. Uh, I apologize for any um, problems with the presentation today. And part of it is because it's a part of the semester that's just very busy and I'm trying my best to do too many things at once. And sometimes the articulation is not as precise as it otherwise would be, but thank you for bearing with it. It's been a last two weeks of somewhat sleep deprivation, but I'm hoping that what I said made some kind of sense to you. So thank you all for being here today and I look forward to your questions and comments. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Leach. And now it is the turn of the audience. Uh, please put your questions in the Q&A line at this time, and I will read them to Professor Leach. While we're waiting for questions to come in, I'll, I'll ask uh, one of my own. Um, and that has to do, uh, Burma, uh, as it was called in those days, was a British colony. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm wondering what responsibility do the British bear for the oh. current troubles of Myanmar, be perhaps because they forged an artificial oh. state where nature did not intend the nation to... Oh. Boy, to Judy, that is a wonderful question. And I, I'm saying that with all sincerity. What responsibility does the British government or the, do the British people bear historically because they colonized that part of the world? I guess we could say that with any nation state where we see um, domestic conflict. So we could say even you know, international conflict between Pakistan and India, for example, what role do the British have in addressing that in contemporary times and trying their best to be an honest broker um, that, that is a great question, and I unfortunately can't give you a succinct answer, and I don't even know if I can give you a provisional answer. I don't know if they bear any responsibility, and I don't know how much any intermediation would be welcomed by anybody in Myanmar. Uh, we know that Aung San Suu Kyi was educated in London. She left uh, Burma. She was educated in her teen years in India, and then she ended up going to Oxford, and she was in the UK. So a lot of people might identify her as being more British than she is Burmese. Um, but the Myanmar government was very concerned about her becoming a formidable political force. And for that reason, they explicitly put in the constitution, as I told you earlier, that nobody can serve as president if they have foreign born children. So my long answer longer is if there were somebody who could speak on behalf of the British government, it would be Aung San Suu Kyi. But I think that even the British government are keeping their distance from her because of what they believe she did in the violence towards Rohingya. So that wasn't the best answer, but that's the best I can do for right now. Well, that's fine. Um, I will urge our audience, please put your questions in the Q&A line. I do have a couple of other questions of my okay. own uh, though, uh, while we're waiting to hear from the audience. Okay. Uh, Myanmar, obviously it, this is a human tragedy, what's going on there. It, it's a terrible situation, but looking at it from a somewhat more detached perspective, of what strategic importance is Myanmar to the United States? Well, that's also an interesting question. I guess as a neighbor of China, we are concerned about the well-being of anybody living in those nation states. Um, not only are we concerned about Taiwan's sovereignty, and what might happen if China were to do something as audacious as invade Taiwan or threaten Taiwan with invasion, even at a higher mm -hmm. level than at present. But any nation state that is a neighbor of China is a concern of ours. If they are invaded, would that mean that the United States would come to the aid of those neighboring nation states? And I'm thinking geopolitics now, the supposed rivalry between mm -hmm. China and the United States for supremacy, however we're going to define that. But strategically, what, what importance is Myanmar for the United States? 
I can't say that they've got some incredible, most desirable resource that is essential for our quality of life. Yes, they have some jewels and other things that have been smuggled from Myanmar. Yes, they also produce uh, narcotics, which is a problem that has been funding the military yeah. government. So, uh, you know, of course, those are concerns for us. We're trying to end the pipeline at the origin of the drug trafficking. But as far as true strategic importance, other than its proximity to China, I can't tell you what is so important for the United States, but I, I'm not in any way trying to minimize mm -hmm. Myanmar or Burmese people as a people or as a nation state with that comment. But um, yeah. it's yeah. Speaking, I, speaking of the proximity to China, Myanmar is located between India and China, yes. historic enemies. And right. what are the historic relations between Myanmar and China on one hand and Myanmar and India on the other. Is there a natural cultural affinity between Myanmar and one or the other of its neighbors? That's, that's a great question. Is there a cultural affinity? I think that the cultural affinity depends on which ethnic group we are talking about. Mm -hmm. um, so that is a great question. At present, they have diplomatic relations between all three nation states. So mm -hmm. Myanmar has diplomatic relations with India and also with China, and India and China also have diplomatic relations. So it's not as if besides territorial mm -hmm. boundary disputes between those three nation states, it's not as if there is something that's dividing them to the degree that we see in other parts of the world. For example, with India and Pakistan, there's problems there, or you know, obviously like North and South Korea, um, mm -hmm. but there's nothing that is on the minds of people in Myanmar that is saying, we have this conflict with India, or we have this conflict with China and vice versa. So thank okay. you for that question. I think you mentioned that there were, uh, uh, well, I wrote down 150. 35. 35. 135. 135 recognized nationalities yes. uh, in Myanmar. And my question is, are they mutually intelligible? Do they speak enough similar languages that they can talk to each other? Wow. Is there a, a common language that they use? How, wow. do, how do they wow. talk to each other? <laughs> well, that's a, that is a great question also. Uh, I guess that there, in, now to be honest, uh, I can't tell you how many official languages there are of Burma. Mm -hmm and how many people are literate throughout Burma who can understand languages other than the one spoken closest to them. Mm -hmm. So I think the tr transmission of government laws, policies is always going to be problematic in a country with a high poverty rate mm -hmm. and a fractured nation state made up of different ethnicities. So how, how, how widespread are those official languages and can everybody comprehend those nationally official languages? Honestly, Judy, I can't tell you the answer to that, but I can imagine that there would be complications with penetration, which means the government telling people to do some, something and them understanding mm -hmm. it and then responding to it yes. and enforcing the laws. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we, we see the same to some degree in the United States, as we know. If you go, especially among older generations who might be um, even, you know, decades older uh, than we would imagine, but they arrived at some point in their life and they went to a dominant ethnic part of our country and they've never had to leave that little area where they mm -hmm. feel like I can do everything here. Why should I leave, for example, Chinatown or why should I leave Russia town or little Korea or wherever it might be? And how many of the people who were there can actually speak what is not even our national language as a policy, but how many of them can speak English? How many? And you know that in a country that's developed and not impoverished to the degree that Myanmar is, even for the United States, it's a, a difficulty. If you're a Minnesota resident weighing in today and joining us, uh, you probably have seen census forms. In recent times, those census forms on the reverse have multiple languages listed. And I think that that is a frank confession by the Minnesota government 
or the US government that many people can't read or understand, comprehend the languages that are essential for functioning in this country and understanding the laws. So there they are in all these 10 different languages on the reverse. If you speak this language, it says in the native language and you have problems with this form, contact this or do this or go here or go there. And again, that's in the United States, but Myanmar is even more problematic, I think, than what we have in the US. We have a message from someone in the audience who looked up the situation of uh, language in uh, oh, yes, Myanmar. And uh, according to this uh, person, Burmese, yes. the language of Myanmar is spoken by two thirds of the population. Right. And that is the official language of the country. Thank you. Uh, thank and, you. But, yes. but going going back to that slide, when I mentioned that there are 150, or excuse me, 135 government recognized ethnic groups in Myanmar, that slide also said that two thirds of the population is ethnic Bamar or Burman. Uh, mm -hmm. And so they can speak their own language. And that also means that, or it implies that the one third of the population who is not ethnic Bamar can't speak Burmese. Now I'm sure there are plenty of those people who can, but um, again, the overlap between ethnicity and language in, in Burma is very strong. So we would assume that all educated people, especially those in university level education can speak Burmese, but outside of that group of people, I'm not quite sure how many can. And uh, so one last question that's a little bit off the topic, but uh, it seems to me that the one uh, Myanmar figure that, that I can remember aside from Aung San Suu Kyi is, uh, was a man named Utant. Yes, who was the uh, Secretary UN, General? UN Secretary General. You're right. And what yeah. what happened to him? What what group did he come from? And what oh, do you, you know, know anything that happened to him afterward? <laughs> now you're dating me. I'm hoping that the person who found out that Burmese is the only official uh, <laughs> language of Burma or Myanmar can tell us that because I can't check the internet right now. But I do remember, of course, um, that he was the Secretary General. Of uh, of the United Nations, but I don't remember what. I'm happened. afraid I, I'm dating myself. No, so no, 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 no. I can I remember. Him. I so don't somebody... remember. Okay. Uh, well, we'll we'll somebody, move on. Somebody can look that up. I don't think that did he die in a plane crash? Was he? Oh, no, that was Doug Hammerschild. I yeah, I know Doug Hammerschild died in a plane crash. Oh, maybe I, maybe Utans did too. I, yeah. But please, somebody somebody who's weighing in now can just okay. Well, we'll go on to another question. Yes, please. Sure. Um, let's see. Uh, I'll just read this from the chat line. Although it should have been for anyone who's listening, please put your questions in the Q and A line from now on. But I'll read this one. Uh, what is uh, Myanmar's major export, especially its exports with China? Is there a dominant, uh, is there a wealthy class? Is there an, an elite, an economic elite in Myanmar? Oh, boy. That's right. Now we're getting challenged with the questions. What <laughs> is the, the primary export? Well, I know, and this is a really obvious and a very pat answer, but I know that there is some uh, primary resource that um, that is exported beyond those sweatshop materials that sometimes are manufactured in Myanmar and then they end up in China and then mm -hmm. the labels are switched from made in Myanmar to made in China when they arrive in China. Um, but I think that it was either oil or coal that is going from Myanmar to China. And somebody again could check that for me, but. Uh, what is the primary export product? I, I don't know about that one. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. Here's yeah. a comment. Uh, it is hard to believe that there are 135 different ethnic groups. Yep. Is it possible that they have more in common with each other than difference? Wow. That's a great question. I wonder the same how can a relatively smaller size landmass country have 135 officially recognized minority groups? You know, I, I guess we could say, well, if we go to another neighboring nation state, China has 56 um, mm -hmm. recognized, clearly not recognized identifiable ethnic groups. 
So 135 in a country that is much smaller than China seems to be impossible. And maybe the, the question asker is right. Maybe they do have more similarities than distinctions. It, is it? Please. I was going to ask, you know, does it have something to do with geographic terrain? Are these isolated mm. groups because of mountainous terrain? That, that is a great question. And we could assume that that is part of the reason why people were not interacting with others, especially in the pre-modern era. And they maybe were living lives of isolation and they didn't actually go over mountains and everything that they needed was within reach and they were content just being left alone. And now maybe people ended up as a result speaking their own languages and now they're trying to retain those languages and their cultural practices. They don't want to see them disappear. And the Burmese government has recognized them as official minority groups. But at some point, you never know. You know we always have also seen degrees of this in China where those 56 officially recognized groups are now subject to assimilation. So mm -hmm. Xi Jinping is essentially being a hypocrite by saying we are going to value the rights of those independent identifiable groups, but we're also trying to make everybody Chinese. And that in this case implies the Han Chinese who are the 92% of China's population. Well, 92%, of course, is much larger than 66%, which is the Burmese yeah. percentage of the population. But anyway, so I guess that any government, if it truly wants to assimilate the people and consolidate the nation state, it has been done in the past. And it's usually through brutal practices and you know, using violence and you know, refusing to allow people to use their native languages in schools mm -hmm. and other things. So, yeah, but you're, that, that's a great question, question asker about the 135. Is it possible mm -hmm. if there's more similarities than differences? And yeah. again, as I mentioned at the outset, I can't speak a South Asian or Southeast Asian language. And maybe some among us today are one of those identifiable groups. And maybe you see that the other groups that hail from Myanmar are similar in many ways to what your group practices, mm -hmm. but maybe there are such divisions between them that they will never be able to see eye to eye. And of course, everybody wants to have their own cultural and you know respect and other things. So, yeah. yeah. Good. Well, someone in the audience did us the kindness of looking up Utant, uh, oh, yes. and I'll just read what, what he typed into the Q&A line. Utant, who served as Secretary General of the United Nations from 1961 to 1971, boy, I am dating myself, <laughs> was uh, chosen to head the world body when Secretary General Dag Hammarskjöld was killed in an air crash in September 1961. Yes. Utant retired at the end of his second term in 1971 and he died in 1974 after a long illness at the age okay. of 65. Oh dear. So for anybody who's as old as I am and remembers Utant, now you know. <laughs> well, thank you for that person who looked that up on the internet. Thank you. Yes, Dag Hammarskjöld did die in that plane crash. I remember that. I was mm -hmm. uh, barely alive at that time, um, <laughs> but still, uh, I, I thought that I had read earlier that something terrible happened, but good to hear that Utan died of natural causes. But still now in, in 2022, 65 seems to be a relatively young age yeah. for somebody to die, but maybe you know the hardships of his life um, living in, in then Burma might have limited- Hastened his, his end. <laughs> yeah, hastened yeah. his end, right. Well, if there are no other questions from the audience, um, I want to thank uh, Professor Richard Leach. I want to thank, uh, I see that we have two representatives of Ali with us today. Okay. I want to thank Grayson Simmons and Carmi Blyfus, who is often behind the scenes. And I'd like to publicly recognize her uh, contribution, which is considerable. Thank you very much. Thank you to the audience. I do have a couple of things to mention. Um, before I talk about next week, uh, I sent out uh, an invitation, a slightly uh, erroneous form of the invitation to the Zoom uh, last night. Um, I, there is no talk uh, scheduled for November 11th. That was a, a, an earlier version of the um, 
schedule that I sent out. So our we will have two more talks uh, next week and then on uh, November 4th. For those of you who are looking for uh, Professor Leach's email address, I did uh, type it into the uh, chat line. You'll find it there. It's very simple. It's R L E I T C H R Leach, his last name, at gustavus.edu. Um, I want to thank, I'm sorry, go ahead. Most, I'm so sorry, Judy, but the most difficult part is trying to spell Gustavus. But if, <laughs> if you don't have that chat after you leave, the Zoom meeting this morning. If you just remember, my first name is Richard. And then if you know how to spell Gustavus, just type in Richard Gustavus on Google and my face will appear with my email contact on that screen. So maybe that's another way to find me. And I can say too that uh, you all have my email address, I believe. Anybody who has my e email address, just send me an email and I will relay it on to Professor Leach. So Thank one you. way or another, we will get you the PowerPoint slide. Okay. Next week, we're going to hear uh, from uh, Dr. Raymond Kuo, who will be speaking on the Quad Alliance. Oh. And for those of you who don't automatically know what the Quad Alliance is, I will confess that I looked it up. That's how I know. The Quad Alliance is Australia, India, Japan, and the United States. So please join us next week for Dr. Raymond Kuo speaking about that alliance. But for today, um, we thank you very much. And uh, we will say goodbye for now. Thank you.